This is Manchester city centre, and behind all these posh shops lies a story that changed Britain and the world. And it's all down to this stuff, cotton. It's only just over 200 years ago that cotton cloth started to be manufactured in this country, and Manchester soon became the powerhouse and driving force behind the new cotton industry. The building at the heart of this story lies here in the city centre, and it revolutionised British society. Built in 1780, on this spot was the first cotton mill in Manchester. Today, it's buried under this car park, and we've got just three days to locate and retrieve one of the most important historic sites in Britain. Not that you'd know it today. Francis, if there was a mill here, they've managed to wipe out every single piece of evidence of it. Well, not actually, Tony. Behind you there, you can see you've got cobbles. Now, I think that was the surface of the yard that went outside the mill. That's certainly early 19th century cobbles. So presumably then, Mike, the front of the mill was ran along those cobbles. Yes, Francis, we've actually got a number of maps. This is one from 1831, and it shows the mill as a rectangular building with a reservoir below it, and then the cobbles running in between. If we know that, then why are we bothering to dig the site? Because although this is a factory that's been used for 150 years, Tony, we don't know how the mill was laid out, we don't know how it develops. But digging one rectangular building isn't going to take three days, is it? Not one building, it's been rebuilt a number of times. It burnt down in the 1850s, for instance. Arkwright created two cutting-edge systems for the mill. The first was a steam engine to power the mill directly, something no one else had yet achieved. The second was an innovative water system that used a steam engine together with a water wheel. The site hasn't been developed since the Blitz of 1940, when a mill rebuilt in the Victorian era was destroyed by the Luftwaffe. Kerry, this is it. This is the wall of the mill house. We've got the yard out there, and here's the wall, and then inside the mill. Let's see a bit more of this wall here. If Phil has hit the wall of Arkwright's 1780s mill, he's uncovered a building at the root of massive change in Manchester. A building that helped transform a village into a metropolis. As day one nears an end, we're still not sure if Phil's walls are Arkwright, but Mike's confident of the date of the wall in Trench 3. Well, we stopped digging and starting the recording. What's happened here? Well, what we've got here, Tony, is we've got the end of the mill. Uh, we've got the cobbles here, yeah. and then we've got a, a line of bricks. They're a bit bashed about by a couple of holes which have been bashed through in the mid-20th century, but either side, we have brick walling. You see, we've got two rows of bricks here, and then a row of bricks and some stone sets over here, and we think that's the doorway into the mill. You say it's the doorway into the mill, but earlier ah. you said to me there were lots of mills at different times. There are lots of mills. Now, we're pretty certain this is Arkwright's 1781 to 82 mill. Why? This is a brick from 1854. It's very sharp, it's wire cut, and it's quite chunky, very nicely made. However, that is a brick from this wall much, much more irregular. It's made in a wooden mould, it's a slightly smaller si a size, and it's far more irregular. And this was made in Manchester between 1780 and 1820. This is the brick from Arkwright's first mill. For you, this dig isn't just about some old bits of machinery, is it? No, it's about the really terrible lives of the people that worked in the mill and lived right in its shadow. In fact, over there, there were some buildings that we think had cellar dwellings underneath them where the people may have actually lived. We're going to look at those tomorrow. Should be some good finds there, shouldn't I there? hope so. But in addition to that, we've started work on this trench here, which is going to be huge. And already we've come up with this really interesting arch here. So tomorrow, we're not only going to try and get into the hearts and minds of the people who lived here, but into the heart of the factory that dominated their lives. Bridge has made great progress on her Angel Street house, revealing nearly a complete cellar dwelling in just a couple of hours. Victorian reports from Frederick Engels and others describe the hardships of living and working in the mills of the area. One of our team, Stuart, has got a personal insight into what mill life would have been like. His mother worked in a mill near Leeds. 
I remember how little money we had in those early days, and uh, I can remember hiding from the rent man when we, because we when we were a bit short on a Monday night, we used to we used to have to keep quiet. Um, the lights were turned down because the rent man was expected and things like that. It's weird because whenever we talk about mill life, it seems like it was another era. It's amazing to me that you, who a relatively young bloke, thank you, <laughs> still remember it. Well, I do. I grew, I grew up with it. My my mother was a weaver, worked in in the weaving sheds all her life. She was incredibly physically strong. She worked eight looms at once but had to keep them all going the whole time. So incredibly hard physical work. You know, one of the historians told me, and I thought this was so extraordinary, that all those northern comedians who used to speak like that with all those <laughs> gestures, they actually did it, not as an affectation, but because virtually all of them worked in the mills. And it was so noisy there yeah. that they continually had to do all that elaborate communication, otherwise no one would ever understand what they were saying. Yeah, and I can actually remember you know, the, the looms turning, the noise, the workforce, the people. And one thing I remember about the lost my mum's friends, um, the weavers, is that they, they'd lost fingers. Because uh, when the shuttle was going backwards and forwards, you had to catch it and turn it round. And if you didn't get it right, it took your finger off. And I remember a lot of my mum's friends all, all sort of missing the odd end of their finger or a finger missing and things like that. So injury and deafness and hard work were all part of a, a weaver's life. Beginning of day three, and guess what? It's raining in Manchester. Mind you, it would have been pretty wet here 220 odd years ago when Richard Arkwright built his mill, because we're pretty sure the whole thing was powered by water and steam. Not that we've found that much of the factory, because every time we've got anywhere near it, it miraculously seems to disappear through our fingers, isn't it? So are you really confident that we actually do have the water wheel here? Yes, yes, absolutely. Oh, hooray, hooray, hooray. And yet you've been found wanting so many times over the last 48 hours. Why are you so sure? Well, all the maps tell us the water wheel was in this position here where we stood. We've seen it on the radar plan, but if you're not convinced, look at this vertical section. There's the top of the ground. That red line marks that road surface. Below that road surface is this clear response. That has to be the wheel pit. And does it work for you in terms of the logic of the architecture? It does, Tony, because we're in the middle of the mill, and that, in an arc mill, is where the water wheel will be. So why is it so significant that we find this wheel? Well, it will tie everything down. Yeah, I mean, if you know the position of the water wheel, it transfers the energy via a shaft into the mill. And once you know the position of that, you can work out where all the looms are, how many there would be. The whole layout is dependent on finding that. Back on site, the hunt for the wheel pit isn't going quite as planned. Francis, can I remind you of an exchange earlier on today? Tony, are you confident <laughs> that there is a water wheel in this trench? You four? Yes, 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 yes. Hello, water wheel, where are you? It's not there. Uh, it's turned out to be a little bit more complicated than that, Tony. <laughs> is it? Uh, yeah. In fact, it's, it, it's all happening as we speak. <laughs> Phil down there has got something, and I don't know what it is. And he won't tell us. Francis! Yeah? Got it! Really? Yes! Yards away, Phil's now uncovered the thing that ran under the wall. <laughs> Come and have a look. Oh, hey. What do you think <laughs> of that, then? <laughs> I, I wasn't <laughs> expecting that, Phil. It's a 20th century drain. Well, I'm completely gobsmacked. <laughs> <laughs> I reckon we might actually finally have this well pit, you know. That is deep. <laughs> that is deep. How deep are you now? Well, I did dangle a tape over there and it was 12 foot, so it's supposed to be 15 foot, so I'm, I'm my money's on three more foot. And that's eight that, feet wide? That's eight foot wide, yeah. so bang on the money for that one. And we didn't see it. <laughs> <laughs> all the walls down there, all four of them, appear to be lined in this stuff, and, and, and it's all the way round. Well, that looks like that pitch or bitumen. But that's the ceilings. That's right. Then presumably that hole was designed to take water. That's going to protect the brickwork. Yeah, yeah, it would have to be watertight. So that could mean that's a well. What if this is the very first steam engine he installed, the 1781 one, which was meant to be running the machinery? That would have to be in the middle of the mill, like a water wheel, to run the machinery. It failed, 
but instead of building a new engine, they adapted it as a pumping engine. That, that would mean that we found our 1781 engine and, it, and, and it, under our very noses, it was here all the time. <laughs> okay. Okay, thanks, mate. <laughs> it's deep. It's massive, isn't it? <laughs> all right, so if the wheel was in there, what about the steam? Come over here. We now think this is the site of Arkwright's 1781 steam engine he tried to use to power textile machinery. But if that was his very first engine, that was the one that didn't work properly. It so, was. So why is it still here? Well, it was positioned in the middle of the mill so it could run the line shafting to power the textile machinery that way. Yeah. It didn't work, so what it looks like they've done is they've reused it for pumping water from the lower reservoir through the well there and out onto a spillway into channels running that way. Somebody has tried to apply steam to textile machinery. So this isn't just archaeology, this is history. This is where the modern world begins. If you'd like to see more episodes like this, you can make it happen. Our new target is to reach 15,000 worldwide supporters on Patreon by the end of 2025. This will enable us to continue expanding the Time Team world. Enjoy front row seats for the greatest show on earth and under it. Last year, an amateur archaeologist was walking through these woods when he came across a load of lumps and bumps and they were very lumpy and bumpy. He was told that this site played a crucial role in the defence of this island during the Second World War, and he realised that it needed to be looked at before it was lost forever. So he talked to Time Team about it, and they said that no one has ever dug a site like this before, because although this is British soil, these defences aren't British. They're German part of the vast complex of defences built by Hitler to turn Jersey into an island fortress. Oh, and by the way, that amateur archaeologist was me. So I'm going to be under quite a lot of pressure over the next few days. In the early summer of 1940, the Channel Islands became the only part of the British Isles to be invaded and occupied by the advancing forces of Hitler's Blitzkrieg. For the islanders, it was the beginning of five years of the cold reality of life under hostile occupying forces. And even now, 70 years later, the islands are littered with the remains of that occupation. During the occupation period, 40 to 45, we're talking about some 65,000 plus mines being laid in the island and probably over 26,000 tonnes of other munitions. And it means for the next three days, our archaeologists are going to have to be rather careful when it comes to any small finds they uncover. This is a 75. If you happen to uh, tap one with your trowel, I suggest you uh, stop tapping it and basically <laughs> make your way away from it. So, are you still happy to go ahead with this? I think I feel slightly more cautious about that, I think. <laughs> so, with the briefing over, it's time to get our first trench in. Now you say, don't hit it hard, and then the first thing you do is you go... And it's essential we're vigilant, because our site at Les Gillettes is a heavily fortified German anti-aircraft battery that overlooked the airport and dominated the surrounding landscape. Now hidden under a canopy of trees, this rare wartime RAF reconnaissance photograph shows the site in its prime, and it suggests it once dripped with heavy artillery. Looks like a weapons pit, doesn't it? And it's the right size to put one of the 20 mil in rather than one of the big 88s, yeah. OK. But for me, it's a lot more than just learning about the position of flak guns. It's about the archaeology of the only successful invasion and occupation of Britain since 1066. I mean, this was meant to be one of the open areas they thought we could look at, but, uh, I mean, it's just a non-starter. Unfortunately, not everyone is quite so enthusiastic about my choice of site. I don't know what we're going to do. So, with GFIs somewhat kiboshed by the vegetation, we're going for the old-fashioned approach. Our first trench over a possible gun emplacement has gone in based on the aerial photograph and Stuart's surveying skills and he's already given us a position for a second trench. 
There's a whole series of structures here that look as if they're buildings associated with the emplacement that Phil's working on. And this might be where the crews look after the gun, as it were. This is where people might actually be living. We're not expecting anything big and concrete. It's not a bunker type of building. It might even be just a timber building. The which... way you're talking, you've actually got very excited about this site. I love you? it. It's like just wandering into woodland and suddenly finding all these things above ground. But if you've got that aerial photograph, do we actually need to do a great deal of archaeology? Well, we do, because this was taken in 1944. They could have put all sorts of other things here which wouldn't even be on this aerial photograph. In spite of being only 70 years old, we haven't been able to find any written records for this site. They were probably destroyed by the Germans before they surrendered. Wondered whether it was part of a field kitchen, but... That's not going to work for filling it full of uh, soup, is it? So It looks too fragile for something like a gun mounting, doesn't it? Doesn't it just? Well, there's our first mystery on this site. <sighs> yeah. We have two days now, left to find out what that is. And people say, why do you bother digging it? You know what everything is. But we have sorted out trench one. Yeah. It's not just a bank that's thrown up to go round a gun. The defense... As Phil's discovered that the defences built on this hillside were engineered to last. What we seem to get is this, this inner stone-built revetment and then we've got this fine grain material pushed against the outside of it to make the actual bank. I mean, that makes complete sense. You don't want enemy shell fire or bullets striking stones. So you put the soft stuff out there and that will absorb the energy of incoming um, ammunition from the enemy. So our first trench can confirm that this earthwork is a 20 millimetre gun emplacement. And it was strategically placed to shoot down low flying aircraft. Phil's emplacement up on the top here on the highest point, that's a, a 20 millimetre gun. That's designed to be quick moving. It's got a rapid rate of fire. And as we know this shape is a 20 millimetre gun, we can confidently say that all these features are also 20 millimetre guns, which isn't a bad result for one day's digging. But as Stewart's discovered, they were just part of a sophisticated setup to defend the airfield and the island against Allied attack. The 88s, the bigger ones on this side of the hill, they've got a dual purpose. They've, they've got a 360 degree arc on the sky. You shoot anything up in the sky, as it were. But they're also able to depress their barrels downwards so they can cover all that area by the airport. And they can actually see right down to the bay at the south. These larger 88 millimeter gun pits will be our main target for tomorrow as we begin to extend our investigation because it's now clear that this whole hillside operated as one big settlement. And it is that wider landscape that's starting to prove really interesting. If you come round the back of Phil's Trench, you can see here we've just started to bring up this cache of small German finds. But this one is my favourite at the moment. It really is rather curious. It looks like a German medal, but in fact, it's a fake German medal. I'm relieved to say this site is starting to be really quite intriguing. It's the start of day two in Les Gillette, Jersey. Right, I think we've got another Another bullet there. Oh, yeah. And we're beginning to get used to finding ammunition in our trenches. That's another one of these German 7.92 cases. It's uh, standard small arms ammunition. It's not surprising, really, as we're trying to piece together the complex layout of this World War II German anti-aircraft battery. By the end of yesterday, we'd made our first breakthrough. And we now know what this earthwork was all about. It was the sight of a 20 millimeter anti-aircraft gun. So far, so good. But today, we're going after the big stuff. Because if the 20 millimeter emplacements on this site were like the muskets of anti-aircraft warfare, then it's these massive enclosures housing 88 millimeter guns that were the cannons. 
that's what an 88 millimeter looks like with its crew. It's got an eight man crew. It sits on a big tripod. You need something about 12 meters wide. And this is an incredibly powerful gun. If, if, if we had a gun here, you see the, the contrails in the sky, people going on their holidays? Yeah. And they're at 20,000 feet, thereabouts. This gun would bring that down. Wow. That's an incredible gun, is that? So far, we've only been digging about a third of this battery. And Stuart feels it's about time to investigate another target at the other end of the site. You know, from other flat batteries, you know what to expect. There's a guns, and then there has to be a, a fire and command control centre close to the guns, and sometimes have a shelter for the crew underneath, like a bunker or something like that. Not necessarily concrete, could be dug down into yeah. the rock or the earth. Well, I mean, the results don't necessarily suggest concrete bunker, but certainly something that's going deep into the ground and appears to have collapsed and be full of rubble. Mm. We need a trench across that anomaly, don't we? I mean, there's mm. no question about it. Very, very interesting. Well, we've already marked it. Oh, well, <laughs> <laughs> using powers of prediction, that's fantastic. <laughs> that's hard ground, isn't it? So we're opening a new trench over a potential bunker, and very quickly it becomes clear there's something rather interesting deep down. But it's red here. There's some tile. All oh, right, it's a tile. Oh, brick. Or something. Your line too. And if we can work out what it is, it'll help us build a picture of this hillside 70 years ago. Using all the cutting edge technology we have at our fingertips. This tray is stuff connected with the occupation. It doesn't look like much, but that's the fastener from one of the ammunition boxes that would have serviced the 20 mil cannons. Uh, this is the one that had us all in, intrigued yesterday. It seems to be like the replica of a medal. Well, I had a word with one of the local collectors last night, and he produced this. Oh, yeah. This is a war merit badge, second class, with swords. And I think they're obviously trying to have, make a little homemade version of that here. I love the idea of a trenches gag, don't you? Oh, yeah, I mean, are they sitting up here, awarding each other huge decorations? You offer you are to Iron Cross first class. And it's probably something conscripts posted a long way from home have done since the beginning of time. Back in Rakshar's trench, a morning's industrial pruning has now revealed that we do have the sight of an 88mm gun. Can you see these metal bolts coming through here? Oh, yeah. I've also got this circular feature as well. I'm wondering whether this is actually the gun placement. I think you're onto something there. We're, we're... And it's becoming clear that the gun was at the centre of a substantial piece of engineering. At the moment, what we've got uncovered is, what, about a third of it, something like it's that? It's about a third, cos you can see the bank coming down that side. It's actually really massive and just it coming through there, so I think we are pretty much in the middle. I reckon, then, what we need to do is try and extend this and get at least a half of it open, then that gives us some understanding of, of how the whole thing would have been laid out. Great, better carry on, then. A bit more digging. Slowly but surely, we're getting a sense of the force once stationed here. In fact, it's turning out to be a rather enjoyable journey of discovery. And then we discover the last thing we need. Ian, I think that's perhaps where we stop, because I think we've got some form of ordinance going on. And this time, it's not a stray bullet. Right here, right behind it. Babe. It looks like a very real, very live artillery shell. Hi, it's Faye here. Um, is anyone around to come and have a look at some potential ordinance in my trench, please? We'll get someone over. Brilliant, thank you. Not very happy about this. I don't want to get too close, actually, funnily enough. Strange. Um, it's the afternoon of day two at our German anti-aircraft gun emplacement in Jersey. And it looks like we've just found a very unwelcome reminder of what this site was all about. Well, it's definitely the base of a shell case. Uh, it's almost certainly an 88. What I don't know at the moment is whether it's uh, the actual case is alive 
and whether there's a, a shell at the end of it, which is the more hazardous part of the item. The whole reason Faye's been digging this trench is to investigate some of the structures on this fortified hillside, because we're discovering that although the anti-aircraft guns were at the heart of this site, they didn't exist in isolation. The communication cable comes from here. And Phil's now uncovered evidence that the gun crews were being coordinated by central command units. If we got the cables coming in here and actually skirting past, could they be coming to that AEA up there? Well, that'd be the most logical. There's nothing in between, is there? And Stuart now believes he's found the location of one of these control centres. We're looking at something sticking out to about this distance. At the moment, this, uh, on the balance of evidence, is the best candidate we've seen for a command and control centre. It's the, it's the biggest complex on the site. It's central to all the anti-aircraft batteries and so on. This would be a perfect target for a trench, except for one small detail, the best spuds in the world. Shame it's under potatoes, eh? <laughs> so in this case, it's Jersey Royals 1, time team nil. This material here might very well be propellant. So we, still, we are talking about a, quite a long case. OK. And potentially then unfired or fired? Definitely unfired. Back at Faye's trench, we're now ready to lift our unwelcome find. Oh, my God. <gasps> OK, what's that? It is 88, but it's what they call a drill round, and they would use it for practice and drill in, on the, in, when they're firing the guns. So it's not dangerous? No. Ah, oh, that's a really... <laughs> Beginning of day three here at Les Gillette, my little forest deep in the heart of Jersey, where we're trying to piece together the story of a World War II German anti-aircraft battery. And although we've done pretty well, we've only managed to identify four features so far, which is a bit worrying because we've only got one day left and I've got an awful lot of these cards still to put up. But the features we have identified, an ablution hut, a foxhole, and 20mm and 88mm gun emplacements have allowed Stuart to start identifying similar features in the 1944 aerial photograph. Another 88 emplacement here and another 88 there. And that, in turn, has given us other potential targets. So you should have a rangefinder. It's like a pair of binoculars, but the one lens is out there and one lens is out there to get the range of the aircraft as they come and send instructions to the, to the big guns. But we're also picking up other archaeological features that suggest that as the war progressed, this fortified hillside was redeveloped. We've got a concrete crew shelter, but it's different to the other ones we see here because it's got an emplacement in front of it. So our final trenches go in over these intriguing features around the perimeter of the site. Oh, it'll be rubbish. So, Faye, this looks like a big hole with a lot of demolition rubble pushed in the base of it. Over on the other side of the site, Faye, having recovered from her shell shock, is trying to resolve the mysterious potential bunker. So, at the back there, we've got what looks like a dividing wall or something, and then we've got all these cables coming in as well. And it was this trench that produced one of the weirdest-looking finds I've seen in a long time. Yesterday afternoon, our entire dig ground to a halt for a bit when we found this shell in amongst the archaeology, except that when our bomb disposal bloke looked at it, he said that it wasn't a shell like this. It was, in fact, a pretend shell, which was all a bit of an anticlimax, wasn't it? No, I think it's fantastic. We thought we'd find lots of these, the, the, the live ones, but this is a really rare. It's a practice shell. Why do you need to practice putting a big bullet in a big gun? Well, if it was just one person working, not a problem. But if you've got eight of you, you've got one guy opening the breech, another man putting the shell in, then the breech is closed. On the right-hand side, you've got men operating elevation and traverse, and the others running up one every four seconds with a new shell to fire. I think it was our Stuart who said that when you fire one of these things, it can bring down an aircraft thousands of feet away. Yeah. How... Does it manage to hit the aircraft so accurately? It doesn't. 
what it actually has is a timer set into the fuse at that end, and that's set electronically, and that predetermines when it'll explode. You don't actually try and make a hole in the aeroplane oh. and then go off bang. It goes off near the aeroplane, underneath it, above it, and it's the fragments that then do the damage. Once the war finished, there was a concerted effort to defuse and remove all the shells from the island. But even now, they do surface. Stuart, so this is the offending 88 that we've got to get rid of. It is indeed, Phil. We found one of our own yesterday, and apparently the best way to dispose of it is to blow it up. It's just not worth trying to open it up uh, manually uh, to try and preserve it. You're placing yourself at great risk doing that. The, the best thing to do is we'll put a little charge on this, this item, and then we're going to proceed down the beach, dig a hole, Ah, that's where I come in. <laughs> I wonder why I was invited and I wonder why I was given a shovel. I know now. <laughs> While Phil gets used to the idea of burying something as opposed to digging it up, Matt's now got to the bottom of his bunker. It's obvious it started off as an ammunition store for the 88mm gun Rakshar's digging. They've been really shifting some heavy stuff around. The scratch is going down there and down there. Ammunition boxes, things like that, perhaps? Yeah, I guess so. But the defences thrown up around it suggest that it changed use as the war progressed. Firing! One, two, three! <laughs> That's amazing! Well, it was a complete success because of your digging. It was it, absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> so with our shells successfully disposed of, we can now concentrate on working out what we've actually uncovered on site. And it's clear that by the end of the war, the Germans had built a sophisticated complex of trenches against ground attack. I just can't believe how big this thing is. Meanwhile, Rakshar and Phil, fresh from the beach, have revealed an 88mm emplacement as robust as any Roman archaeology we've ever uncovered. We've got that little bunker area over there. We can actually see now where all the timber revetment is. But the main thing is, this is a seriously big piece of engineering for a seriously big gun. So we've got a fortified enclosure as sophisticated as any Iron Age hill fort, with six massive guns capable of throwing up a barrage of exploding shells, while 20 millimetre gun emplacements dealt with lower flying aircraft. But by the end, it was a fortress where starving troops lived in fear of invasion, and the 88 millimetre guns, including the one in Phil's trench, were now lowered to overlook the island below. Well, basically, we've got a sort of a, what I like to think of as a cross between a Roman fort and a, and a wooden box. The Roman fort bit is the bank that goes all the way around. That gives you your protection. The wooden box bit is the fact that all these edges would have been revetted with timber. And in fact, when you'd have come in here, you'd have seen wooden sides and wooden flooring. And in each corner, you'd have had an ammunition box there and an ammunition box there and probably one over there. But the central part is really what strikes you. It is an enormous hole that is filled up with concrete. Yeah, and right in the middle of it, there's the one thing that's missing, which is that enormous metal killing machine. Absolutely. But you can just see the imprint of where it once stood. You've got these bolts here where it's actually been fixed to the concrete. And clearly, at the end of the war, they cut them all off except one, and then they lifted the gun away and, thank God, took it away. Yeah, glad it's not here anymore. Join a thriving worldwide community of Time Team fans on Patreon. Our new target is to reach 15,000 worldwide supporters on Patreon by the end of 2025. This will enable us to continue expanding the Time Team world with more digs and greater access than ever before. Finds scattered across this field near Manchester inspired a local enthusiast to start field walking. And for eight years, He's been walking and walking and walking. Now, after hundreds of hours of close scrutiny, 
He's accumulated evidence of over 8,000 years of human activity, from the prehistoric to the post-medieval. But it's the Romans who seem to have been particularly active. There's loads of metalwork, including coins, brooches, and this gorgeous little snake bracelet. But the site itself remains an archaeological mystery. So what was going on here? Local archaeologists believe they've discovered a fortlet, but then not all the finds are military, and they cover over 250 years of the Roman occupation. So what were the Romans doing here in Warburton? We've got just three days to find out. Warburton's located near Manchester, between the River Bolin and the Mersey. The village can be traced back to the Anglo-Saxon period, and its parish church is dedicated to St Werburgh, the Anglo-Saxon saint from which Warburton takes its name. But over the past eight years, the locals have been finding evidence which has pushed back Warburton's origins much further. That's a pretty impressive array you got there, James. It is, isn't it? We've got stonework here from the prehistoric with the flint work. We've even got Bronze Age, a small axe there, which is really nice. Yes. But what's really excited me on this side is all the Roman material, the brooches and some of the coins and the various little bits and bobs. What do you think it all means, Mike? We've got quite a lot of material here from the Roman period which is distinctively military, the, the, the brooches in particular and these nice little rings. But well, we don't get, usually, in the northwest this kind of concentration. If we're looking at military, I think we could be looking at something like a fort or a fortlet. It does seem to me to be a bit of a leap of the imagination. From a few finds to an imperial fort with loads of soldiers hacking away at the poor Brits. But we do have a bit more evidence. The, the local archaeology society have put in one or two trenches already in the field. And they've got what might be an enclosure. And in one of those trenches, there's a ditch, a, a Punic-style ditch. What's a Punic ditch? It's a trap, a Roman military trap. Francis, could this site be a trap for the enemy? Well, I think you've got to be a bit, you know, a bit sceptical, because I've seen steep-sided ditches on farms, and to my eye, that metalwork doesn't look military. Um, I think it could be a farm. I think we've got to be very, very careful. You know, rectangular enclosure doesn't mean fort there. So we're putting in our first trench next to the previous excavation, so that we can look at the form of this ditch and decide whether it really is Punic. And this will tell us for definite whether the site's military. David, what was the difference between a Punic ditch and any other kind of ditch? It has a, a standard V-shaped inner slope, but the outer face is vertical or near vertical, which means that once you've got in there, it's extremely difficult to get out and you become a sitting duck to uh, the defenders to throw anything at you. Why were they called Punic ditches? Does that mean they came from Carthage, as in the Punic Wars? No, they didn't actually come from Carthage, but the point was that the Romans thought the Carthaginians were extremely treacherous, and these ditches were meant to be treacherous to anybody who attacked across them. As the field walkers continue to march across the field, we still can't be sure whether our Romans were soldiers or farmers. But the finds are coming in thick and fast, and we're hoping they'll give us a clue. Oh, have we got much? There is a lot of this um, stuff that looks like brick, isn't there? I wonder if any of that's going to turn out to be the good Roman pottery. It is, it's just bloody sand, isn't it? Look. Just sand, sand, and more sand. <laughs> it's like digging at Bournemouth, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> at our trench, it looks as though the Romans are about to make an appearance. Mike, there's your ditch. That looks promising, doesn't it? So it does look as though that charcoal was coming out right the other side, right on the edge of it. I'll be happier when we've got it sectioned. Yeah, Francis, you put in the long jump pit. Well, look at this. Hey, have we got something? Yeah, look at that. <laughs> well, careful, it took us all morning to find that. Oh, wow. Really, on day one have I ever seen <laughs> such a cornucopia of finds. <laughs> Time's of the essence since we've only got one day to explore the whole field. So everyone gets busy. Everyone, that is, except Phil, who's refusing to be dragged away from yesterday's trench. And Helen's still got loads of James's finds to double-check. It's quite worn on that edge. So that's fixed yeah. into the wood of the, of the 
<clears throat> cart somehow. Is it in the, the I reins? I think it is. I mean, it's some way of distributing straps around yeah. around the cart. Mm. Um, so a rain travels through that? Yes, yeah. yes. First century. Yeah, I mean, the rain would have run through there because you've obviously got quite a lot of wear yeah. on this edge here. It's gone quite thin. Okay. And at our original field, Phil's tenacity has paid off. And yes, he's got a result from his trench. I've never been quite sure why we've explored quite this far out in the field. Well, if you remember, there was metal work that was coming off the crest. There were two concentrations, and Phil's trench was to come down the hill and, and, and follow that metal work. Well, actually, it's been much better than that. We've found two lynchets. What's a lynchet? Well, it literally is it's an old field system. What you've got to imagine here, Tony, is literally a, a stairway of, of fields running parallel to the slope. And what is happening is that f uh, plough soil, as you plough along the slope, soil moves down the slope. And where France's is, you will have a bank. And down here, you've got a cutaway terrace. You can see here that you've got uh, a dark brown topsoil, that's this stuff, and it comes straight on to natural. Now, as we come down the slope, we've got three layers. We've got the dark topsoil, but in the middle, we've got this brown material, which is sloping down here, and at the bottom, we've got the natural. And this brown material is where the plough has actually sliced into the natural and moved all the soil down that way. So you'll have a bank here, and here there's a big cutaway. And so you've got a whole series of stairways. And you can see that the next cutaway terrace is up there where the chap is there. So you've got these, these fields that are about, what, 20, 30 metres wide, going down the hill. Do we have a date for these lynchets? Well, we, we, we've got scrappy pottery from the, from the bottom of this lynchet that runs through the Roman 16th century and 18th and 19th century. So we might have 2,000 years of agriculture ploughing on this site. But it, the important thing is that is exactly when the metal finds were being made. That is exactly the date of all those metal objects. What's exactly the period? The medieval or the Roman? Roman into medieval period. This was a purely agricultural landscape, but we now under, understand the mechanism by which it formed. And until we dug this trench down here, we had no indication that there was a pre-existing field system on this hill. The only field system that we could see was the present field system. This shows that there was a completely different landscape here in the Roman and probably the medieval period. Which is why it's not on the 18th century map, because the, these fields are totally different. So finally we're beginning to reveal the history of this landscape. The lynchets are evidence of an earlier terraced field system, possibly Roman. And this would explain how the finds got into the soil, as rubbish mixed in with the manure which fed the crops. Well, Stuart, we're getting wildly overexcited about two lynchets out there. How do they fit into what we know about the landscape? I mean, if you go back to the medieval period, uh, what you've got is the, is the medieval village of Warburton here in red. You've got a, a, a church down here and a priory, arable ground here, meadow around the edge, and, and park and manor centre up here, and the peat and mosslands over here. But you've got a strip of open ground, all suggesting that this strip where our fields uh, located is the pasture for the animals of Warburton village and the parish. So that's the pasture on which you'd have had the animals that would have manured the arable. That's right. Yeah. This is quite important in the understanding of this. Yeah. Also, the pattern of movement it actually is along that road that's there today, the road that we, we come along, leading from Dunham straight down to Warburton and then crossing over the river. The Mersey itself is an important boundary in the Saxon period between Mercia and Northumbria. And if there's Saxon occupation close to a major boundary, there's a very strong chance there might be even Roman occupation. So those, those lynchets that we found are likely to predate the medieval pasture, you reckon? Indeed, uh, yeah, I, I, mean, I would say that quite categorically from the evidence I can put together, yes. So Phil begins to dig a trench in the new field over the biggest response to see whether there are any finds and to analyse how they got into the ground. Is that in the spoil that's coming out or is that in the... Could it be really, really small or can't it? Oh, you... it is very small, yeah. It seems to be pretty localised, doesn't it? Is it in there, for example? No. Let's try that for what I've got in my hand. No. 
try that. In there, then. It's over in that corner somewhere. Yeah. Must be very, 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 very small, whatever it is. Lead. Well, I'm damned. It's a lead seal. You know the seals that you put on the bags? That's what I think it is. It's quite a nice little pattern on there, yeah. isn't it? Our prize find. Who needs Roman when you've got a seal from a 19th century seed bag? The field's now littered with trenches and Helen takes a quick tour to see what's turning up. No features? No. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> Anything good? The last bit that came up, courtesy of the detector, was that. It was the last bit we came out. It looks, looks good on that side, doesn't it? Yeah. And, uh, not much on the other side, probably half a button. Never mind. OK, thanks very much. You're welcome. This whole field is dotted with tiny, discreet test pits, and suddenly we've got Phil's zonking great hole. What's that all about? <laughs> what we're hoping to prove is, is that there's a different pattern of finds in the top as opposed to the, that bit there. There. Yeah, then the subsoil, and then on the, on the natural and in features underneath there. And how are you getting on, Phil? By and large, all the finds that we're getting, they're mainly Victorian, post-medieval. The main thing is that we're recovering all the finds, not just being selective with metal. And certainly, once we get through the topsoil, which is where most of the finds are, once we get into the subsoil, we're not getting anything at all. So <laughs> what does all this tell us? It's telling us quite a lot. I mean, it's telling us that this soil has to be manure. That's where most of these modern finds are getting in, finding their way in. And then it's also telling us that below that, there's a rather different soil, which may represent pasture, and then possibly earlier fields are, are beneath that, but that earlier soil wasn't being heavily manured. A bit frustrating for you, though, all this digging empty trenches. I spend my entire life digging holes and finding nothing. I went with Ian, you know, the main digger driver here. He and I, dug 1,800 metres across Salisbury Plain in four days. And what do we find? One post hole. Was I disappointed? No, of course I wasn't disappointed. The main thing is you solve the problem. We came here three days ago. We came here with a set of questions. We wanted to know about the forklift. We wanted to know about the metal objects in the plough saw. And I think over those three days, we've answered the specific targets. I know what did really hack you off, though. The local pub didn't serve real ale. <laughs> yes, you're right there. <laughs> Join Time Team on Patreon to access exclusive 3D models, masterclasses and behind-the-scenes insights. <laughs>